and it's mid-October 2021. Got a delightful uh, mid-fall day here. And today finds me on the Connecticut-Rhode Island border. I'm in what's called the Arcadia Management Area in Washington County, Rhode Island, and right across Beach Pond here is what's called the Patchogue State Forest in uh, New London County, Connecticut. I've had a chance to spend uh, quite a bit of time here the last few weeks and um, I'm going to introduce a tree that I didn't know what I, I would put on this channel when I started this channel but I'm finding a lot of it in this area on these thin rocky soils and this is um, the remnants of a great civilization. This is the American chestnut I'm going to introduce today. I found a lot of it in Pennsylvania this summer as well. Um, and some of these trees are getting 30, 40 feet high. So these are the remnants of trees that were once much larger. And these are the root sprouts that have survived over the generations since the American chestnut became almost extinct in the uh, early 1900s. Um, I've been finding a lot of it out here lately. And so we're going to start recording it as I find it. There's none on this ledge here. But the thinner soils in this area um have created an opportunity for the chestnuts to um hang around Let's zoom in of this beautiful sassafras tree here the sassafras right here is getting orange and yellow and nice contrast to the oaks that are still green at this point in the fall did a little uh I got here a few weeks ago, put it on my other channel called Arcadia Management Area and hiking to Deep Pond and exploring the surrounding ledges. And that Deep Pond is right on the border or at the edge of this map shown as a partial teardrop shape. So that's on my other channel called, the channel's called, called Barking Up, excuse me, Let's Dig a Little Deeper. And we're recording for barking up the right tree today so we're doing a slightly different route today we started at the P on the east side of the causeway that highway 165 takes to cross beach pond and there's a P there and we're going to follow the southeast shore of beach pond up towards what's called the hemlock ledges overlook and there's a whole series of blazed and unblazed trails that head back towards deep pond and in and out of the ledges that are very common in this area. And we'll be looking for chestnut sprouts and some medium sized chestnut trees that I found a few weeks ago and even some ones that I didn't find. And we'll continue on with our study of the American chestnut tree, but well, we really can't pass up this chance to admire this sassafras sapling putting on an incredible show. And Mixed in with this mountain laurel and scarlet oak around here, there is a little bit of American beech. This is kind of thin soil to be finding a lot of American beech here. But let's study an American beech leaf before we get to chestnut. Because the two are in the same botanical family, the beech family. And um, very, the leaves can, can look quite similar, but everything you see on a beech leaf here would be exaggerated probably three times over. On a chestnut leaf. We'll be studying those in just a few minutes here. So we have parallel leaves, or excuse me, parallel veins leading to a tooth, singly toothed edge on this American beech leaf. I've got many clips on American beech at different times of year on this channel, including the fall and winter when the leaves have turned brown but haven't always dropped to the ground. And that American beech leaf is about as long as my index finger, about three inches long. And the buds on these American beech trees, once the leaves are down, are about a half inch long and quite pointy. Probably more pointy than other, any other bud of any other tree I've put on this channel so far. So, um... Similarities to the chestnut, but not identical. 
but you know to a casual observer this channel is made for people that go outdoors to do their hiking biking fishing hunting camping backpacking this is meant to give you things you can use to identify trees as you're on the move and not always the fine details that I'm using to teach these lessons. So um, American beech and a chestnut leaf could be confused to the casual observer. We've got plenty of chestnut right up the hill here. Let's go take a look. And in the mix of this forest with the scarlet oak and mountain laurel in the understory here, starting to find some chestnut sprouts. And um, it seems to me the thinner the soil is, and the less uh, shade there is, the more we find the chestnut sprouts. And what I've been reading is that, you know, the chestnut trees died in the, between 1900, 1904 and 1940. Most of them did. And um, the sprouts came up as the tree tried to, uh, you know, regenerate itself. And the uh, open canopy in this area is often caused by gypsy moth damage, where the trees have died from gypsy moths. And it gives these chestnut sprouts a little bit of an advantage, or at least a chance to grow, where if it was deep shade, they may not. So, um, boy, looking up this, you know, from a, from a, as walking, at, at a hiking pace, this would look like a beech sprout. Um, let's get a closer look at these leaves here. And we've got one here. Get my index finger in here. I guess my thumb will have to do this time. There's my thumb, two inches long, and this leaf is probably six inches long. And yes, there are some smaller leaves on this sprout as well, or this 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 uh, root sprout. So they're not all large, but they're always larger than beech leaves. They're almost always larger than beech leaves. They're always longer than they are wide by several factors. So they're narrower and longer than a beech leaf. And the teeth are much larger, probably a quarter inch in size on these chestnut leaf teeth. And the beech leaf um, teeth on the edge of the leaf are probably no more than a sixteenth of an inch. So um, take that beech leaf and roll it out and make it longer. And it looks a lot longer than it is wide. And then you've got a chestnut leaf. And this sprout is maybe only eight or ten feet high. And this is how I've often found them while hiking in the Appalachian Trail in the past and up in Pennsylvania and western North Carolina. And um, never really found anything that was what I would call tree size, but hiking in this area the last few weeks and even in western Pennsylvania this summer around um, the Dubois area, I found some that were 30 feet high and I was beginning to debate whether I should put it on this channel and I, and I am. So this is just, um, you know, a smaller one here like I've often found them over the last 25, 30 years. But let's go take a look at some that have lived longer and got larger. And just a couple hundred yards down, this is called the Deep Pond Trail that leads the Deep Pond in Rhode Island here, right near the Connecticut border. Um, we got a sprout that's taken right off, and it's um, probably 30 feet high. And this chestnut sprout, if it was a sprout, I'm assuming it's a sprout from a previous tree and that the there were no trees big enough to make seeds that could... Um, grow on their own in this area. I don't know for sure about that. I'm just um, assuming that. And this guy goes way up. And their leaves are a little hard to see from this view here. I just zoomed in about eight times in size. Uh, did an eight times zoom and now you can see those teeth quite clearly. So this guy took right off. He's got a fairly smooth bark at this age. is about three inches in diameter and again I believe what I've been reading, and it makes it's common sense tells you this, that as these other oak trees die from dip, gypsy moth damage, this what would have been a smaller sprout of this chestnut tree may have had the chance to really take off. And um, that's all fine and dandy, but as soon as this bark gets old enough to develop fissures or furrows, the chestnut blight can infect it, and that's what that yellow color is there. 
So unfortunately, the fact that this tree is growing rapidly and taken right off to fill the void left by the gypsy moth damage on this oak forest may be its own demise because the sprout that may have been around for several generations all of a sudden is getting big enough for the bark to stretch out and form furrows. And then you get that damage um, in the cracks and it can what, what that does is the blight gets under the bark and um, creates a toxic environment for the plant. I won't get into details on how that happens. I have done some reading on it. But um, that yellowish orange color um, is evidence that the chestnut blight is getting in this tree and um, is inflicting damage. It'll, you know, if I come back in a few years, this tree, tr this tree may either be dead or dying. So, um, but it's nice to see that they do have a chance to get large enough to be considered trees again in some parts of the country. And um, we'll keep looking. There's quite a few back here that I saw a few weeks ago. Let's keep looking for them. And we've come about another quarter mile on the deep pond trail here. Well, let's just soak up some of this beauty here. We got black birch with a beautiful gold color. And a ghost town of dead uh, oak trees. They're far enough gone. I can't tell what kind they were. I'm guessing they were scarlet oak because that's so common on this area. It's got very thin acid soil back here. Um, and based on the acorns I'm seeing as well. We got one uh, red maple there that seems to be uh, hanging in there pretty well. And more ghost towns of, of dead oaks. This area was hit really hard back in the 80s with gypsy moth damage and repeated episodes uh, since then. So um, let's get a look at this uh, chestnut here. This guy's at least 30 feet high. Um, getting some nice color of his own. And probably six inches in diameter, so it's nice to see that these we can start calling these things trees again. I hadn't hiked in this area in quite a few years, so this may have been something that was always here and I just hadn't noticed from lack of hiking in this area. But hiking in other parts of the country, I never saw chestnuts this big until recently. So um, let's enjoy them while they're here. Again, if they get too big, all it takes is one crack in that bark and that pathogen... The chestnut blight has an entrance to harming the tree. But again, that leaf is much longer than it is wide, and the teeth are much larger than that of the American beech. But the veins do resemble it, and the fact that it has evenly spaced teeth that are single teeth does also allow one to confuse it with the American beech, from a distance at least. So again, our bark here, six inches in diameter, And it's starting to develop ridges and furrows, but I don't see any evidence of the blight getting in this tree yet. Um, so again, these things might have half a chance to live long enough to actually set seed. And um, I've got some seeds from a tree that was in more of a park setting that I found that actually was um, about 12 inches in diameter and I found the seeds on the ground. So uh, we'll look at those in a few minutes here, but I'd say in the winter time, this would be easily confused with the uh, red oak or any of the other oaks. Um, the bark isn't that much different. The branching isn't that much different. But when the leaves are on these American chestnut trees, it is a unique appearance and one that uh, you know we should be thankful to have a chance of seeing. But at one, once upon a time, this was king of the Appalachian forests. They were uh, very common and very bountiful, and the the masts crops were used by animals and humans for generations until the uh, blight showed up um, from another part of the world in the early 1900s. And this Arcadia management area in the adjoining Patchogue State Forest in Connecticut um, have miles and miles of trails for your enjoyment and a large variety of plants, especially the acid-loving plants. We're going to put the wraps on the study of the American chestnut. I've got one right here. It's a little tangled and twisted, but it's, again, 25, 30 feet high, and it's got a trunk here that's about six inches around. And it's starting to get some breaks in the bark there where the um, chestnut blight could get in. But as far as I can tell, this tree is still healthy. 
Um, and those furrows in the bark could resemble that of a red oak or some of the other oaks um, when they're of similar size. And right up the trail here, we'll just pause a second. There's one that has succumbed to the chest chestnut blight, um, but it still has sprouts coming out. So let's take a look at this one. So they don't really die. They just, the main trunk dies and then the tree keeps sending up sprouts. And as long as those sprouts can make enough food for themselves, they don't die. The tree doesn't die. Um, the fact that it's been almost 80 years since it became, let, you know, in 1940, it was considered pretty much functionally extinct. So it's been um, 80 years since this tree was even around in any great quantity or any great size. So it's obvious that it can exist in the sprout form for generations. And again, when these openings in the canopy happen, from what I can see, at least in this area, the trees take right off. Now, what we're looking at here are the sprouts of a chestnut tree that had reached about an 8-inch diameter there. And the top half of it, at least, is long gone, is deceased. But the bottom half still has sprouts coming out of it. So again, like I showed on that tree with the yellow discoloration, sometimes they're a victim of their own success with this chestnut blight. Um, still a problem for the larger trees. I did find a larger tree in what used to be a farm. It since became a park. But I think the farmers may have planted this tree because it was much larger than any chestnut sprout or medium-sized tree that I found. And it was big enough to set fruit. And here's what they look like. And this is the porcupine of all the uh, tree seeds that I put on this channel. This is much spinier and much harder to handle than anything I've ever dealt with. It really hurts to pick this guy up. I mean, you don't want it. You don't want to grip it at all. You can let it rest in your palm. It's about the size of that pocket knife, about two and a half, three inches in size. And it splits in four husks. And there's a dried up nut inside this one. I didn't find any chestnuts inside any of the husks that I, that I split open. I did find one here that looks like it's dried out a little bit. This one here that I didn't open may have a healthy nut inside it. I'm not going to open it up at this point. I'm going to leave it the way it is. But if the trees live long enough before the blight afflicts them, it's possible they could start setting seed again. The one I found, I believe the farmers may have planted. And um, somehow it survived to uh, reproduce. And this is our American chestnut, which in its own way is starting to make a comeback, partly because of the problems caused by the gypsy moth in this area. And um, it's not immune to the blight here, but it is getting large enough to consider a tree again in some of these areas. Um, in the Appalachian Mountains and uh, the foothills of the Appalachians where I'm hiking today.